Okay, I think we're ready to go. I got the thumbs up from Stefan for me, the sign to go on. Uh, thank you very much for being, be, uh, being back here once again on time. We're running like clockwork. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a very interesting speaker, once again, someone with a book, Idris Aberkan is here. Uh, he's uh, famous for his thoughts, of course, about the economics of uh, knowledge. Knowledge is something he's very interested in. He even goes as far as saying knowledge is our new oil in the future. It's going to be something very important and cer certainly something he knows uh, uh, something about on a personal level. That man had three doctorates at the age of 29. Who can compete with that, right? So I'm going to uh, uh, vacate the stage as quickly as possible. Uh, we're very curious to hear his thoughts on artificial intelligence, the challenges, but also the opportunities. It is the stage is yours, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you can launch the slides. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah. All of you? Yeah. Great. So, uh, I'm actually heading and I founded the, uh, the Swiss Foundation for Bio-Inspiration and the, the purpose of this foundation is to make sure that heads of state would one day rather find biodiversity than oil on their territory. Uh, the, the rationale being that knowledge is more valuable than oil and that's not an opinion, it's a fact. I mean, South Korea is crazy rich. And uh, of course, Facebook that sells data is way richer than say Total uh, that sells oil. But the point is, Knowledge is more valuable than oil at pretty much any time of history. And nature is the largest deposit of knowledge. If you want to drill for knowledge, if you want to extract a knowledge barrel, nature is the place to go. Uh, so we did run, last year we, we, we ran the uh, Route du Rhum that say, uh, uh, it happens every four years. Okay, this is the, the classy one actually. We crashed one week after that. Uh, but, you know, for some reason, I prefer to show you this picture. Uh, but it just shows you that any road has to be kind of bumpy. Uh, but today, I will be telling you about artificial intelligence. And uh, let's start with a simple question. Where is, uh, wh what's that movie? Where is it taken from? Yeah, right. This is Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Dr. Strangelove, or how I learned to uh, stop worrying and love the bomb. And in Dr. Strangelove, you have this great actor, George C. Scott. Now, George C. Scott... Um, he played George Patton in the biopic Patton, and he refused the Oscar. Uh, a few years later, he refused the Oscar because he said every human performance is unique and having a grading system for actors doesn't make any sense. Uh, that could be a great argument in the AI world already. But in Dr. Strangelove, He's representing a, something that actually happened. Um, most of the people who saw Dr. Strangelove don't know that. What it describes, even though it is stated at the beginning of the movie, uh, it is uh, the stated policy of the US Air Force uh, to say that this could never happen. It, something really close to what happens in the movie actually happened and AI was involved. So for those who haven't seen the movie, uh, the story, and I won't spoil you the end of course, uh, is that at some point a general goes crazy and decides to launch the nuclear armed bombers to, to the Soviet Union. And since everything was automatized, uh, there's pretty much nothing that can be done. I mean, the signal has been, has been delivered to the pilots and they're, they're ready to deliver their uh, nuclear payload to, to USSR and they seemingly can't be stopped. So here you see General Buck Turgidson here seen in a uh, very busy uh, work session. And um, it's just learned that, that some crazy general has decided to attack the USSR and the rest of the movie is about how do they stop them. Well, again, that's a movie, right? Uh, but it almost happened. And uh, this gentleman is Binyev Brzezinski. Uh, for some people, he's uh, Das Vader. For other people, he's Master Yoda. Uh, he's probably one of, he's probably both of them at the same time. Uh, you either hate him or love him, but uh, he was one of the greatest geopolitologists of the 20th century. And uh, he was the advisor of Jimmy Carter. And uh, he did receive the 3 a.m. phone call in 1977. In 1977, he receives that phone call. Uh, Mr. Uh, what's this? Security advice, National Security Advisor, Dr. Brzezinski. Uh, do you recognize my voice? Oh, yeah, sure, Douglas, we, I recognize your voice. Uh, I talked to you uh, three hours ago. Well, you, you do imagine, uh, Dr. Brzezinski, I would not be asking you that question if it wasn't damn important. We do have 250 uh, missiles on our radars. It looks like we're at, uh, in a shooting war with the USSR, and uh, the president can't be reached, so what do we do? And uh, Brzezinski explained that this night he had to make two decisions. Decision number one, do I wake up my wife? 
<laughs> the real decisions, right? Uh, and decision number two, uh, do I bomb the Soviet Union? Uh, so, okay, he decided not to wake up his wife and that was a very mathematic decision making, actually. He was, okay, there are two possibilities. Uh, I was trained for that, I know there are two possibilities. Possibility number one, it's a real shooting war, uh, in which case we'll all be dead in about seven minutes, so she better sleep. It makes sense. And uh, second decision was like, uh, okay, maybe it's a false alarm, in which case we'll be discussing it with Bacon and X tomorrow morning, so she better sleep as well. So in, in both situations, I should not wake my wife up. All right. Second decision, do I uh, order nuclear retaliation on every uh, USSR cities? Now, of course, as the name indicates, his name is Zbigniew Brzezinski, meaning he's of Polish origin. He was actually born in Poland. He freaking hates the Russian, like he hates the guts of Russia, uh, big time, and he knows he won't be objective, but still, I mean, we're talking about nuclear war, so he waits. He waits because we have nuclear submarines, and the only purpose of nuclear submarines, for that matter, is to allow people like Spinev Brzezinski to wait. Because if you have a decapitating strike on, say, Washington and all the nuclear silos and everything, the nuclear submarines will still be hidden somewhere, and they will still be able to retaliate, so you can wait. And the reason you pay billions for them when you're a nuclear power is just to afford those, like, three more minutes for somebody like Brzezinski to decide in case uh, some nuclear missiles appear on the radars. So he waits, he waits, and he gets another phone call. Dr. Brzezinski, this was a mistake. <laughs> All right, do you want to tell me about it? Sure, uh, come to the White House, we'll be uh, debriefing it. And uh, what has been um, published at the uh, archives of Congress and everything was that, you know, they had a, I mean, uh, nuclear war is not something you learn uh, uh, by practicing it, right? <laughs> so you, you never thought about that, but <laughs> now you know, right? Uh, so you have to run simulations, and, and you run them pretty much all of the time. And, and uh, those simulations, that's how you train. And uh, they were running a simulation at the NORAD, and uh, the guys who had put the tape with the information of like the attack profiles had forgotten to put the freaking computer in um, simulation mode. And that's the declassified story. I can't tell you whether it's true or not. All I can tell you is that this is a declassified story of what happened. And, uh, well, it could very well be true because AI was developed for the nuclear war. The story of AI was that it should allow automated retaliation in case of a nuclear shooting war uh, for so many reasons. First off, you could have a decapitating strike and nobody to order uh, a retaliatory strike. Second, uh, some generals, mind you, didn't want to retaliate. They were like, look, if we've been shot at already, uh, the uh, deterrent of uh, our nuclear force hasn't worked, and it's not by killing six million Russians or more that we're gonna resurrect anyway uh, 60 million or 150 million Americans. So some, when they were running simulations, some generals said, no, I don't want to shoot, and I can understand that. I mean, if I was in their place, I think I would really hesitate. So they decided that some of it should be autom uh, automated so that the deterrent would be credible, and that was one of the biggest driving forces uh, behind artificial intelligence, mind you. In the same way that computer science was developed essentially for World War II, I mean, Alan Turing was, of course, working at Bletchley Park uh, for the United Kingdom uh, government to decipher the, the codes of the Nazis, AI is actually coming from uh, the nuclear world initially, even though we've kind of forgotten that. And, and this stuff, I mean, has happened in Russia as well. Uh, you, you may not know this man. His name is Stanislav Petrov, but he saved your life. And he saved pretty much everybody's life because he had the same situation in the 80s, same thing. Uh, a lot of um, blips on the radar in Russia this time, of course, saying that some missiles were incoming. And uh, he decided, because it wasn't like 250, it was like three. Now, you don't attack the largest country on Earth with three missiles. And uh, him being a smart man made the conclusion that it didn't make any sense and it must have been a mistake. But at the time, the USSR was super tensed and uh, if he had passed the information to his superior, it could have uh, gone really, really bad. So he decided not to do it and he went to jail for that. And he went to jail, uh, okay, inner exile, that's how you put it. So he was sent in Siberia to count bears and elks for some time. But he, he saved all of our, uh, our lives and the whole point of this, of these two cases, is that when it really matters, you want some human being making the decisions. That's, uh, that's the lesson there. When it really matters, I mean, otherwise, for simple things, 
Uh, actually, I completely forgot. Would you mind, Christopher, to bring me my, my uh, please? Yeah, because I, I want to take my phone uh, to start a very simple experiment. Thank you so much. Have you guys tried to ask Siri how much is zero divided by zero? <laughs> yeah, we don't have the same weekends, obviously. Uh, <laughs> all right. Hey, Siri, how much is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. <laughs> In case you wanted a pristine demonstration that my life is actually crap. <laughs> All right, uh, what you've just heard is, um, is a so-called bad A to I ratio. Now the A to I ratio is the one and only thing I want you to know about AI and that's the only purpose of that talk. And actually if you understand that, I can stop the talk and you, we can all have coffee. The A to I ratio is the best way to assess the quality of an AI. Now A to I, A is for artificial and I is for intelligence, but the question it asks is how many human beings you needed uh, to train the AI at this level. Now if you want to understand the A to I ratio, it's very easy, I mean you understand the quality to price ratio. The quality to price ratio is what quality I get for what price, right? This car uh, might look great, but it's super expensive as well, so its quality to price ratio is not that good. Uh, the A to I ratio is the quality to price ratio of AIs. And if you want to understand it, you have to think about uh, a dog. If you see AI as a dog, uh, then, I mean, a dog can perform so many services. It can guide a blind person, it can fetch the newspapers, it can bite the mailsman, especially if he sleeps with your wife. And uh, <laughs> only half the room would laugh at that one. <laughs> uh, and the, the point is, uh, a dog is just as good as his trainer, right? Uh, so uh, the thing is, a blind dog, for a blind guide's dog, costs a lot, I mean up to $20,000, because you're paying the hours of that expert who actually trained the dog. And it's not really scalable, I mean you can't have a classroom of 50 dogs and train them all at the same time. So, uh, but with AI you can, I mean that's the good news. So the A to I ratio is how many human beings or how many hours of like professional human beings you had, you needed uh, to create this uh, ability of the AI. In that case, this joke wasn't invented by Siri, right? It was put as a script in Siri, so that's a bad A to I ratio. Now, of course, the dream of Apple, uh, if you want to see where this is going and where, where Facebook is going and where Google is going, is that one day you could go like, hey Siri, could you find a job for my daughter in Singapore? Uh, could you please write uh, three different uh, resumes for her depending on which company she'll be applying to? Could you write her uh, motivation letter as well, reference letter? Could you find three referees for her? Could you please book uh, the plane tickets, make sure it's a window? And uh, could you please buy the clothes she'd be wearing at the job interview and stalk the, p the potential interviewers on Facebook so that you know their favorite color, their favorite dessert, stuff like that, and, and she will know what to talk about. And uh, also, please, Siri, uh, could you make it so that it's compatible with her uh, uh, competition in horse riding uh, on next Saturday. So what I've asked now would take about, what, two weeks for a professional butler? I know in the room there's been, actually, there is a professional butler. A, there is a lady who has been a professional butler and is a graduate of uh, the Lausanne School of uh, Hospitality. And uh, I don't know where she is, but like, uh, and I will really blame her if she's not. So, okay, as a professional, how long would that take, uh, according to you, what I ask, like finding a job to my daughter in Singapore and this and that? What, two weeks? Let's say about that. Would you agree it's two weeks? Yeah, to be yeah, to a top one. All right. So let's say a top trained professional uh, who bills the hours at least $200 uh, would take two weeks. Now, of course, the point of Siri and Apple and everything is that they want that to happen very soon. That you could just use your phone as a butler uh, to do some tasks for you that you could just ask in a natural language. But again, I mean, so far, our AI is not as good as a dog. So if you want a simple metaphor as to what AI can be, really uh, think of a dog. And let's start with this one. <laughs> I, am, I am like drop dead scared of dogs. I mean, I if this happened to me in real life, I, I would really be drop dead scared. Uh, so this is a little bit of my uh, therapy here. Like, <laughs> hello, my name is Idris. <laughs> I've not been scared by a dog for <laughs> about 20 minutes. Uh, Okay, you can train a dog to do so many things. So um, the domestication of dogs, by the way, 
I might have the time to do that digression. Dogs and cats weren't dis uh, domesticated in the same way. I don't know if you were aware of that, but like uh, cats domesticated themselves, which kind of explains everything when you think about it. <laughs> uh, cats, they did domesticate themselves because they went naturally to, to um, uh, how do you call that, grenier in French, how do you say that again? Cellars, granaries? Cellars, you say cellars? Where, where you would, okay, where you would keep the grains, right? Okay, so naturally, sorry? Sealers, right, I don't know, sealers are the old ones. So wherever you would store a large quantity of grain, which was also the beginning of civilization and everything, you would have a lot of rodents, and uh, those rodents would attract uh, cats, like wild cats. And they would come naturally because there are rodents there and there are not so many predators. And mind you, they were welcome because we were really happy to have those cats running after the rodents. So after a few thousand years, we even ended up uh, div divinizing them. They became deities in Egypt cats were sacred, it was completely forbidden to kill them, so much so that the Hittites uh, during a battle actually strapped live cats on their armor, true story, and they won the battle. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, so uh, cats domesticated themselves because they came naturally to protect. I mean, they were not eating grain, so that was a great deal from the beginning. For dogs, it didn't work this way because you had to put a lot of effort in domesticating dogs in the sense that they were protecting things that they would naturally eat. So you really had to train them to look after cattle because normally dogs eat cattle and cats don't eat grain. So that's why gods are way more loyal and attached to their, to their masters, because it took much more effort to domesticate them than to domesticate cats, among so many other reasons. So you could train a dog to bark at somebody. A dog could perform this kind of service. And the moment dogs were domesticated, this would happen. And I, you can't say that the domestication of dog was overall a bad thing, but the moment dogs were domesticated, it was written in destiny that some people would be killed by dogs, uh, including some Aztecs and Inca and Mayas and the like. So for AI, this is going to happen. This is going to happen and it's already happening. And uh, did you know, for example, that you can hack a pacemaker? Yeah. Well, you can. A guy called Barnaby Jack in uh, 2013 demonstrated that you could hack a pacemaker. And in uh, this series, t TV series 24 Hours, uh, there's an episode where or Homeland, I think it's Homeland, there's an episode where they hack a pacemaker. And they say, oh my God, uh, we can't do it because we need the serial number. And Barnaby Jack said, no, in real life you don't. So it's actually simpler in real life than in the TV series. So you could hack a pacemaker. If you can hack a pacemaker, it's definitely meaning that at some point AI is going to kill people. But it's going to save more people, I quite believe. So you could do that with a dog as well. I mean, yeah, this is pretty much the Hello Kitty moment of the... <laughs> So for real, th this dog became viral because he really did jump in a house in fire uh, to, to save his friend, uh, the, the kitten. And that's kind of adorable. So in this case, uh, you see some dogs, they, they jump in water naturally when they see your kids in it. Like some Labradors and uh, Golden Retrievers, some of them could naturally, without training, uh, jump in water when they see your kids in it. I don't know if you've experienced that, but some dogs can bark naturally if they see your kids in the water. Uh, this one, of course, is a professional, a trained professional. You can see his jacket. <laughs> By all means, he's French. <laughs> I borrowed that joke to Gunther, actually. <laughs> the copyright has to go to him. <laughs> Can you imagine that he gave a keynote at Total with a yellow jacket? <laughs> this man is hardcore. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, or if you're really uh, freaked up in your mind, you could train the dog to, to explode under a tank. That's what Russian people did during World War II. And uh, let me tell you why it didn't really work. Uh, who has dog here? Where has the dogs? Dogs, like, okay. So I suppose uh, you had to take your dog go for a poop, right? You didn't expect me to talk about that. So visualize it. Uh, you might have understood that when dogs, or seen, uh, realized that when dogs poop, they can look at you. It's very destabilizing. <laughs> <laughs> and they do that naturally because when dogs poop, they're very vulnerable and they look for their protective figure, which is you. And uh, so they, they go like, you got my back, right? <laughs> So now, translate that to a dog in a battlefield. <laughs> you have strapped a bomb on its back, and this bomb is supposed to explode under the tank and everything. So what the Russians didn't factor in is that when a dog is scared, he goes back to his owner. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the lesson is, <laughs> karma is a bitch. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> 
What's your take-home message? <laughs> uh, so this is a case in, in Spain uh, where they trained a, a dog to do CPR. Uh, so uh, this one is a puppy, he's not heavy enough, but like when he sees someone fall, he's gonna uh, try to jump on his sternum and everything. And it is proven now in medicine that you don't need mouse to mouse anymore. So mouse to mouse, mouse, to mouse is uh, so uh, 2005. And uh, it means that uh, dogs have become competitive in giving CPR, of course. Uh, so he would jump on the guy until he would move and everything. And uh, that's the kind of services that a dog can perform. So my point there is that, okay, you can train a dog to do so many things. But then, in AI, I mean, you've seen Musk and, and uh, Jack Ma, and Jack Ma said, uh, I don't think AI is dangerous, and uh, Elon Musk answered, I don't know, man, it sounds like famous last words. <laughs> and um, is he right, is he wrong? The jury is still out. I mean, uh, you, you take that case, for example, oh, sorry. Putin said artificial intelligence is the future, not only of, for Russia, but for all of humankind. It comes with colossal opportunities, but also with threats that are difficult to predict. It's completely right. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. And that's, that's really true. I mean, uh, from a geopolitical perspective, AI can make decisions. And uh, making the right decisions is all about winning a war. I mean, or the other way around. Winning a war is all about making the right decisions. Ask the French in 1940. <laughs> Again, only half the room is going to laugh at that one. Uh, so you could have the best equipment, the best training, anything. If you make the wrong decisions, it, it doesn't matter. And now AI can make a billion, actually a thousand billion decisions per second, a trillion decisions per second. So uh, that's a force to be reckoned with. I mean, you take like an old muzzle load rifle, it could only fire about six uh, shots per minute. Uh, a Kalashnikov fires 600 shots uh, per minute, so it changes warfare. Uh, AI can make a lot of decisions per minute, and uh, if they end up being rather good decisions, they could make you very powerful. Uh, this is what Napoleon had understood. I mean, he said, the strength of an army, like mom momentum in physics, uh, is mass times velocity, and that's exactly this is the reason that Napoleon's army was unbeatable for some time. It had the biggest mass and it had the biggest velocity, and that's how it could steamroll pretty much anybody. But um, the same goes with artificial intelligence, like how many decisions it makes. So right now, this is the helmet of the F-35, and I'm sorry for showing so many military cases. I'm not really defending the military to begin with. I just want you to be cognizant of the fact that AI is so far developed for that. Now, I believe that uh, just like war is too important to be left to the military, AI is way too important to be left to the military as well. But right now, the highest intensity in research comes from them. This helmet costs $500,000. Unit price, retail price. I'm not talking about the research and development, just the unit price of this helmet for the F-35 is $500,000. And that is because, well, it has this best heads up, this uh, optimal heads up display. Uh, the whole point is to make the pilot make decisions faster because microseconds could be millions of lives. And the Russians, they actually launched this tank, which is really special because the turret is empty. So there is nobody in the turret. It's remote control from the inside of the tank, but normally a turret has actually three people operating it. And this T-14 Armata, which is the latest uh, Russian tank, has an empty turret, and uh, Putin made it clear that he wanted it to be a land drone, meaning that one day there won't be any pilots, and you could just launch uh, swarms of them uh, for an invasion. And that would be really scary in the sense that what would happen with an autonomous weapon to begin with? I mean, you have a weapon that's programmed that say, okay, do, the, do what's necessary. Now, modern wars don't wear uniforms. I mean, mo in most situations, insurgents, they never wear uniforms to begin with. So uh, how to decide who you're killing or not, that's becoming the big debate. And that's what uh, Elon Musk has, uh, has uh, pitched uh, in a way, some kind of Geneva Convention for autonomous weapons. And I, I really back it. I really think we should forbid autonomous weapons, even if they're going to happen, at least like we set a legal precedent. We say, OK, that's bad. I know somebody who's been killed by an autonomous weapon won't care that some guys in Geneva said it was bad. But at some point, it really sets a precedent, and that's the bare minimum we should do, in my opinion. But anyway, today this is what we can do, even in the civilian world, swarms of drones. That's very hard, actually. It, this is hard to do. And the Chinese have an edge at the moment. Uh, so they're, even though there's a big brain drain in AI, and the top AIs, engin AI engineers are leaving China and India at the moment, but there's an arms race. Like Everybody wants to have the best. And this is, of course, inspired by uh, schools of fishes, uh, souls of fishes. You see, the rules are very simple in that case. Uh, you should keep the same distance between each agent. 
So that's the basic rule. You should keep the same distance between each agent. And of course, if you're attacked, uh, you should flee, right? And just this is enough to make it uh, unpredictable. Now, I want you to understand one thing, is that real intelligence is about some kind of unpredictability. And that's where our schooling system could be failing. Because our schooling system, everybody will agree, to some extent makes us predictable. I mean, we, we have to agree on that. Uh, to some extent, our schooling system tends to make us more predictable. And uh, it's not even an opinion. Sir Ken Robinson demonstrated it with extensive tests uh, showing that we tend to become more predictable the more educated we are. We are. Uh, so real intelligence needs some kind of unpredictability. So this is real intelligence, and this is not. I'd like, just think about it for a minute. Like, uh, if you're on the right, okay, you may be more standardized and everything, but like, you're not intelligent anymore. So the, the whole point of um, narrowing uh, the uh, field of possibilities of anything uh, is that actually it makes them less intelligent for any, any agent, any system. And that is why also robotics is copying nature more and more, because nature has those... Uh, has this ability to improvise. So this robot has been purchased by Google, if my memory is correct. And uh, that's the whole point. I mean, we can't really do that. And that's the difference. It looks like it works, but they really set it up. And uh, you put like the slightest amount of unpredictability in that, and the robot cannot cook the omelet anymore. So that's the difference between an algorithm and a physio rhythm. Now, that's the title of this talk, mind you. Algorithms versus physiorhythm. So an algorithm, what's the definition of an algorithm to begin? W what is an algorithm? Who knows that? Right, we all hear about it, but like, it's actually very simple. An algorithm is a set of instructions, a series of instructions that must have zero degrees of freedom. Like there must be zero improv uh, in uh, an algorithm. It's like you do it this way and this way and there is absolutely zero degrees of freedom. That's the mathematical definition of an algorithm. <coughs> if you have degrees of freedom, it's not an algorithm anymore. Now a physiorhythm uh, is the opposite. It's something, a series of instructions that's performed by a living thing. Physios in Greek means living, alive. So a series of instructions that is performed by a living thing, like fetching the newspaper for a dog. That's a series of instructions that actually the dog has a lot of degrees of freedom uh, to execute. And for human beings, it's the same. So um, the recipe for pancakes is a physiorhythm. That's why you can't see, still uh, program a computer to do it, because like, how do you give the degrees of freedom? How do you define how you break the egg, the angle for breaking the egg on the ball? Uh, if it's mayonnaise D, how do you define how you separate the yolk from the white and this and that? So the degrees of freedom are too numerous, and that is why we still can't really program robots to do that. But the best guys to do it, I told you an AI is, is just as good as its trainer. Now the best trainers for AIs, it, turned out, it turns out, are professional video game players. Now professional video game players, they can make up to seven million dollars when they win. And this is like a competition in South Korea, I think it's uh, League of Legends. And uh, these guys make seven million dollars. Actually even today more, maybe 11. And that uh, they're gonna be hired by Google and Facebook to train AIs because they're the best, the best trainers they are. So AI started with tic-tac-toe. On oscilloscopes, John von Neumann started AI on tic-tac-toe, and then you had chess. And like chess is way more complex than tic-tac-toe. If you counted uh, all the number of possible plausible chess games, it would be, it's, it's a so-called Shannon number, and it's, one, it's 10 to the 120. So it's one followed by 120 zeros. That's a lot. But still, computers beat humans. I mean. IBM beat Kari Kasparov in the 90s, and since then, no human being can beat the best machines anymore. Then you had the game of Go, and the game of Go is way more complex. It's a 10 to the 800, which is way more. But still, machines beat humans, and there's nothing we can do about it. And now, the next uh, generation will be video games. And so far, I say so far, it's starting to, like, it's beginning. But so far, machines cannot beat, most of the time, the best human plays because video games are actually way more mathematically complex than the game of Go or than the game of chess. I know it sounds strange though, but uh, that's the way it is. So, to wrap it up, playing video game has become like important. Uh, this is a case of surgery. You operate with handles, this is a real picture. And uh, a screen and, and controllers, they ask the question, do surgeons who play video games, do they perform better? 
What they did the test, surgeons who play video games are 35% better at this kind of surgery. So much so that the study concluded, if you're going to have this kind of surgery done on you, uh, ask your surgeon whether or not he plays video games. <laughs> <coughs> so I mean, video games are a very, very serious business uh, in the case of AI. So I love this philosopher, his name is Jacques Derrida. Uh, he's considered to be one of the greatest uh, French-speaking philosophers of the 20th, uh, 20th century. But during his lifetime, he was deemed a fraud. I mean, he was considered like absolutely nothing like a philosopher. Cambridge was giving him an honorary PhD, and there was a petition of about 60 academics in times, uh, the Times of London um, to say that he wasn't a philosopher because his language was ambiguous. And today, of course, uh, 30 years later, today you ask any AI expert, he will tell you that the measure of intelligence of a piece of software is how much ambiguity it can take. For example, if I just yawn, the facial recognition of my phone won't work anymore. If I yawn, you will still recognize my face. If, if I smile, you will still recognize my face. But if I smile too much, it won't recognize my face. Because this is how much ambiguity the machine can take. And uh, in fact, it's, that's the reason you can't smile on your passport picture. When you, go, when you cross a border, what the people will do is check whether your face, the face they have in front of you, is the same as the one on the passport. And if you smile, and if you smile on the passport as well, it might not work. So this is how much ambiguity machines can handle at the moment. And uh, Jacques Derrida was called a fraud because his language was completely ambiguous in a time where philosophy had to be like analytical and perfectly defined. Today, ambiguity is like the holy grail of artificial intelligence. But I could go even further as a conclusion. And then we'll see if you give me like five extra minutes for anecdotes, but otherwise this is my last slide. Do you have any idea who this guy is? Because, okay. Disclaimer or spoiler or whatever, uh, he represents a serious hard case of intelligence. Do you know who this guy is? He, he looks bizarre, right? <laughs> You're spoiling it, man, but that's exactly that. I mean, I hope you didn't hear, though. This man is Vincent Gigante, a.k.a. the chin, a.k.a. the odd father, a.k.a. the enigma in a bathrobe. This man was... Uh, the godfather of the most powerful crime family in New York, uh, the Genovese crime family. By far, hands down, the most powerful crime family in New York City. Uh, according to Interpol, he was managing a cash flow of somewhere between 20 and 50 billion dollars annually. So the guy was serious business. And uh, he might have been like the godfather of the most powerful family in New York. He was still going around once a week in flip, not really flip flop, but like sandals and socks and pajamas and a bathrobe. Why? It's gonna be my last question there. Why? Wh 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 why would you do such a thing? If you were a godfather, which I suppose you might be one day. <laughs> so wh why? I mean, what's the point of doing that? Yeah? Is it the unpredictable? That's true, but way beyond that, to be able to pretend he was crazy. Right? Mm -hmm. To plead insanity in case he was arrested. <laughs> and uh, it worked. It worked. Uh, he really like, had the FBI for 25 years, actually. Of course, the FBI wasn't that dumb, but like, due process uh, mandates that uh, you would have some psych uh, psychiatric examination. Not directly, right, but based on pictures and behavior and stuff top psychiatrists from Cornell and Harvard, and all testifying uh, anonymously. So there was no pressure possible on them. Uh, they all wrote. At best, he's crazy, <laughs> and uh, at worst, not only is he crazy, but he's got an IQ that's lower than his body temperature <laughs> in Celsius. So um, eventually he got caught because they, they found a turncoat, like somebody who would betray the family, which was super hard because just mentioning his name in the family uh, was uh, punishable by instant death, by I speak. That's quite a deterrent. So if you wanted to say an order came from him, uh, you would put a G, you would like do the letter G with your hand because his last name was Gigante, or you would uh, point to your chin because his, um, one of his nicknames was The Chin because he was a former boxer. So you would say it's coming from The Chin. But still, they found someone who testified and they put a microphone in his uh, Lincoln and eventually he got arrested and he died in, in jail. Uh, two investigation journalists, uh, the name of one is William Engdahl, if you're looking for the, the original source, and the other one, I forgot her name, but she got the Pulitzer Prize, so it's a big deal. 
gave uh, credible, very credible um, uh, proof, evidence that he had been the mentor of someone very important. Who do you think it was? <coughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> Be afraid. <laughs> All right, that's, that's my last slide. I, I, will not, I will not vouch for, for Donald Trump's intelligence. That's not my point. But uh, this, in that very case, is real intelligence. Being able to, to, like, to have the smartest people believe you're stupid or, or crazy or both is some kind of real life intelligence. Now, if you give me four, five minutes, I will give more examples. But otherwise, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Idris Aberkan, a man who certainly knows how to win our heart by showing us pictures of cute dogs. Uh, I'm getting soft in the end of the day, so we, we, we're going to give you five more minutes, I would say, because it's so... Yeah, yeah, that's how I am. That's how I am. Those Thank dogs so got to me. I don't know what to say. Uh, five minutes for questions, because it's such oh, an interesting topic. Uh, I'm pretty sure one of your answers will be, will be a nice uh, story anyway. Is there, a, is there a, a question in a huge field... Uh, of, of artificial intelligence. If not, I, I certainly have one, but uh, I want to let you go for it. Yeah, there you go. Please. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Were you for, paid by... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for the record, I want to state that this... That came very quickly. ...was okay. never paid by me. All right. <laughs> now, the next story, uh, the, the rest was just a buffet of a few natural examples. I wasn't uh, going to go through all of them, but I wanted to pick up a few ones just about how uh, natural intelligence like, is still beating us most of the time. And uh, the next story would have been... Um, those, those, those ants, uh, they're the fire ants in, in South America, and they, they're like super smart. Uh, they, w when they're flooded, when they're in the, the habitat is flooded, they, they build a raft with their own body like that, and they don't even drown because they have a rotation. Uh, so they don't even drown. And uh, w when you test them for stress hormones, they're not even stressed. I mean, this is just another Tuesday for them. <laughs> and uh, that's the way they can just float to some new ecosystems and everything. And they inspired, long story short, they inspired a, a piece of software. Which one? Yeah, I think somebody said it. Hmm? I don't know. They could have, but no. Waze, yeah. The, the Waze software mm. was actually based on ant hills. Uh, there is no traffic jam in an ant hill. Maybe you didn't notice, but that's how they work. And uh, the reason there is no traffic jam in ant hills is that ants they, they leave a small pheromone droplet wherever they go uh, outside of the ant hill, and they're conditioned to following the smelliest path, uh, which is also the most efficient. And uh, this is called stigmergy, if you're interested in the algorithmics of it, stigmergy, from the Greek stigma, the sign, and synergy. And uh, Waze copied it. Whenever you, you hit the brakes, they put a minus on the map, and whenever uh, you hit the gas pedal, uh, or the acceleration pedal if you're running a Tesla, I take 20% on every Tesla song. <laughs> uh, you actually, uh, they, they will put a plus on the map, and by aggregating all those minuses and pluses, they can compute for you the best maps. And mind you, they can even uh, predict whether you're uh, driving a BMW or not, because the accelerometer gives you like a print that fits cars, and very accurately they can say, this, in this road, this street, uh, so many luxury cars, luxury sedans were, were passing, so it's very useful information for the Chinese. So the point is, uh, they sold to, uh, they, yeah, I'm <laughs> trying to elicit new business models there. Uh, they, they sold to Google for $1.1 billion, and they were 90. So Google is the best AI company in the world, one of the top three best AI companies in the world. And they still had to purchase this piece of technology that was coming from nature. So that was it. Thank you for that great question, Nate. <laughs> Can I ask uh, one as well, Idris? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I mean, the question number one that, that, that people always get asked, and, and you know, it, will artificial intelligence one day take over from humans? And then there's always, no, but. And I think that's the interesting but, right? Yeah. And, and you, were, you, were, you were quoting Kubrick, uh, Strange Love. Uh, strange enough, Kubrick did Space Odyssey as well, exactly. where hell takes over which is kind of a nightmare for everyone. Will this happen in your mind? Well, again, that's the billion dollar question, yeah. but AI is way dumber than we think at the moment. Of course, at the moment doesn't mean much, but like right now, we can't even mimic the eye of a rat. We can't. The way a rat identifies objects, 
we can't mimic that in, in the best labs. I mean, Facebook can't do it. And that's why, you know, you're training AI when you, uh, when you register for a new account, like you have to identify which part of a picture have a traffic light or have a car. And you're training AI when you do that. And so far, AI is really dumb. Of course, computers evolved so fast that people like Elon Musk are going to say, if this happens as well, <laughs> AI will take over. But like the reality check is survival. We have no AI that could survive in any condition in nature. Not only small perturbations like uh, these robots that were in warehouses, you know, uh, handling crates. You just push them and they were having a hard time recovering. Not only that, but like ju just that is enough for them, I mean, to destabilize them. But, and you know, that's how you test intelligence uh, in, in hard situations. Mm. Uh, jokes, humor. Um, some, some, you, you try to destabilize the person to see whether they will be uh, able to handle the pressure. Now, in nature, the definition of intelligence is the ability to survive. And no AI is like remotely close to anything like survival at the moment. But of course, when it happens, what do we do? We have to leave it there. I know you, you, you want to hear some more stories. I just suggest you buy Idris' next book, uh, which might be on dogs. I don't know, but uh, we're very curious to hear about it. Thank you so much, Idris Abigam. And he's still around, so please uh, ask for other stories.